welcome to the Rick Fuller podcast presented by Rick Fuller, the team leader of the number one real estate team in the San Francisco Bay Area and Sac County for most recent sales, according to Zillow. Rick is a community leader, national real estate coach, and real estate investing expert. He and his team have been recently acknowledged as a California Distinguished Small Business by the Senate and Assembly. So congratulations, Rick and the team. Well done. I'm Christina Thank Morales, a writer and marketing specialist, and Rick is my dear friend and my mentor. And today we're going to talk about how to create a winning listing presentation. With us today is Rick Fuller Team's listing coach and one of my favorite people, Wendy Shearer. So Wendy, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Christina. So Rick, can you tell us a little bit about Wendy? Oh, absolutely. Well, you are uh -oh. in for a treat <laughs> uh, to have Wendy here because Wendy and I have worked together nearly 10 years. She's been licensed as long as I have, and uh, we have just had an incredible relationship for the last 10 years. She not only uh, is an amazing person, a great listing specialist herself, she, you know, she takes, has been taking, uh, serving our seller clients for many years, but she also coaches about a dozen of our listing specialists and does an amazing job in helping them accomplish their goals. So um, we couldn't have a better person to join us this week, Christine, on the podcast than Wendy. I agree. And every week I see that you have more houses and more uh, listings. So you are rocking it in this crazy time. So I can't think of anyone better to join us. Thank you, Wendy. So we're going to talk about listing presentations and most agents don't share this. It's a secret. It's their secret sauce. Why are you willing to share this with us today, you guys? Well, Wendy, I think I'll cover that one. Yeah. So <laughs> Here, I am absolutely uh, discouraged, frustrated, and disappointed with the lack of professionalism that exists in our industry. And if you think about it, a homeowner um, has decided to sell what often is their most valuable asset, their home. It's not just their house, which they have all of these great memories in or experiences in. It's their nest egg. It's their retirement. It's their kids' 529 plan or you know college education it literally is uh, their greatest asset that they often own and then a real estate agent who comes into their home that they've invited into their house to their kitchen table shows up unprepared hmm. they show up and they don't know the the answers they're not knowledgeable about the community uh, they're trying to wing it they have no plan they have no strategy or they show up and they followed some script that is not in the seller's best interest and they're not even listening to the concerns and the anxiety about that we all go through when we put the house on the market and so our goal here today is to share with full authenticity and genuineness our listing presentation and so that our profession can do a better job of, of doing what we should be doing which is guiding homeowners through what perhaps is the most important uh, one of the biggest financial decisions that they'll ever make, and that's how they sell their home for the highest possible price with the least amount of inconvenience in a reasonable amount of time. How do we do that? And that's what we're going to talk about today. And I, I can't think of a better topic that not only is the right thing to do for our customer, it's the right thing to do for those people that we're meeting with that are contemplating selling their home and what that looks like, and in some sense, uprooting their family, they may have only done it once or twice in their entire life. Maybe they've never even done it before. And I can't think of a better topic for our profession, for our industry. And sometimes a real estate professional is deemed one step above a used car salesman. That should not be the case when it comes to selling their most valuable asset. And so we wanna give some really good strategies, tips, and we're gonna just open up our playbook today uh, if you want to get the slides, you can get the slides from this. Uh, Christine, I know you've posted those and you'll be able to access them. And our goal is that if you're a real estate professional, that you are just that, a professional, and that you show up well prepared and yet also attentive to what the seller's doing and what they're going through and guiding them through the process. Great. Well, let's get started because I know you have a ton of information. So I'm going to get your slides up. 
Okay, so let's kind of start from the beginning. Christina's getting our slides going. And Wendy, feel free to add in here. This is the listing presentation that you have been with me on for nearly 10 years. Mm -hmm. Uh, let me start with this. Uh, I do not believe that having a script or having this memorized uh, is healthy, but I also do not think that showing up unprepared is healthy. Uh, neither of those are, are a winning combination. So instead of having a script where everything is scripted out, people see that. It's not real, it's not authentic, it's not genuine. And instead of just showing up and saying whatever will be will be, we want to give a track, a track to follow. And this track helps you stay on course. You know, Wendy, you and I have been on several of appointments together, and we know them from the PTA, we know them from the community, we know them from our church, we know them from the gym, whatever. And it's very possible that you could talk for 30, 45 minutes about something other than what they invited you over to. Mm -hmm. They're just so happy to see you. <laughs> They're like, well, let's talk about what's happening at the PTA. Let's talk about what's happening at our church. Let's talk about what's happening in our community. And you don't get to the topic at hand. And in some sense, they've never done this before. So the real estate professional ought to have a track that moves this conversation along at a reasonable pace. It doesn't rush it, but it moves it along at a reasonable pace. And we've created a track and it's very simple to remember, and it's called L-I-S-T, list. And ultimately, at the end of the day, if you're a real estate professional, that's what you're hoping for, is that they choose to list with you, L-I-S-T. Uh, L stands for lead in. This is the process that we go through, just getting to know them and asking them questions and building a relationship. And then we go to I, which is investigate and how we investigate both the property and what they wanna do and listen to them about what they're wanting to move and the dreams that they have and the aspirations. Uh, then we go to S and that's show and sell. And you're gonna be showing your marketing plan and how you plan to sell their property. That's ultimately why they're asking you to attend. And then T, we call it tie down and it's get a decision. It could be a yes and ultimately you, you might want it to be a yes, you're hoping for a yes. It could be a no. And I'm gonna be honest with you, that's okay too. Uh, if it's not right for them to sell, it's not the right timing for them to sell, they don't have the equity to sell, it's much better to figure that out now than at the closing table when you have a buyer with a moving truck that's getting ready to be backed into the driveway and they discover they don't have the equity to accomplish what they wanted to accomplish. And so no's okay, or what I call a qualified maybe. And that's the tie down. So list, L-I-S-T. And to do that, you really break this down into three parts, don't we? We break it down into pre, present, and post. What do you do before the appointment? Like, what is that? What does that look like? And I'm going to tell you, do your homework. If, if you are not knowledgeable about the community, if you show up and the seller is more knowledgeable about homes that have sold in their community than you are, that's a problem. If you show up and you don't know what's happening to that vacant field across the street, you're not familiar with new taxation or schools that are proposed, that's a problem. Uh, during the market that we're in now, we started tracking the real estate market week by week. We're no longer waiting a month, we're now doing a week by week. Uh, if the seller knows the real estate market better than you, that's a problem. So do your research, know the market. Know what's happening with real estate values. How long does it take to sell them? What's the list price versus sales price ratio? Are they getting more than the advertised or sticker price? Are they getting less? That, do your homework. Do you know uh, what types of uh, taxes and assessments they have and what things they need to transfer because you saw the solar on the roof? Uh, look at what's happening in the community. Is there uh, multiple communities? Is there HOAs? Is one side of the street different than the other side? I own a house and on, it's an older house, and on the other side of the street's brand new homes. If I don't know that market, I haven't done my research, it's very easy for me to say your next door neighbor, they've sold their home for this price, but it's so much newer, it's so much bigger, it's so much more improved. And so you gotta know the market. And before you show up, make sure you do your research. Wendy, what else do you do before you show up to a property? I also try to get to know the property itself. Yeah. 
So oftentimes um, you need to research who the seller is. You might be talking to somebody who's not actually the seller and that happens. Or you might flesh out that their property is in a trust and they didn't tell you that, which is not a big deal, but it's just important for you to know those things before you go. So um, if you show up and you don't know those things about their property, you, you don't look very uh, smart. Well, that's a great point. If you know the seller, you probably get a chance to get a little pulse on their personality. If you're showing up to what we would call uh, more of an engineer type, which we would define in the DISC personality profile as a high C, they like the numbers. And I'm looking at your slide, Christine, and you've got the graph. And if that's them, and, and, and that's me, I'm a numbers guy. The more colors on my graph, the better. I love the pie charts, the bar graphs, the line charts, the whole bit. If you're meeting with that person, you better have the numbers. It is not acceptable to show up for an engineer and to not know the specifics, not know the ratio, not know the absorption rate or the list to sales price ratio or how many days on market. You've got to know that information. And yet if you're meeting with somebody and they're not the engineer type, and they're more of what we would call in the disc personality profile with a high eye. It's all interpersonal skills. It's a, it, they just, they want, then you can't stay on those graphs or those charts. You gotta make a personal connection. And often in those situations, it's their goal that you want to, in some sense, remind them of what we're trying to accomplish. Because at the end of the day, it's about them buying that next home. At the end of the day, it's about them moving into that new school district. At the end of the day, it's about them moving into that retirement community or that home in the mountains or on the lake or wherever they're going to move to. If you're working with a high eye personality, the interpersonal skills are important, then you want to be able to speak that language. Tony Robbins does a class, and you can watch it on YouTube, called Mirroring and Matching. In some sense, you need to mirror and match. It's not about you. It's about them. You know, I always use this as an example. When it comes to my wife's birthday, uh, I'm never going to get her a DeWalt drill. I'm not going to get her a Shimano fishing reel. Why don't I do that? Because that's not what she's interested in. So why would I ever show up at a listing appointment? Why would I ever show up with a seller and have my presentation style so scripted that I can't adapt because of the person I'm sitting on the side? It's not about me. It's about serving them. And if for them, if I need to have the numbers, we'll have that. And if I need to be able to speak a little bit more emotionally, a little, a little bit on a bigger picture, have a little more passion about what I'm talking about and dream with them a little bit about what this move could ent would entail for them and their family, I wanna make sure I'm doing that. And, and a lot of times you're sitting across the table from a husband and a wife and you've got two different types of people. Mm -hmm. So you have to be able to craft your presentation that speaks to each party. That's a great that. point. And if you leave one out, you're yeah. talking to the wife instead of the husband, you'll, you'll become the wife's realtor. Mm -hmm. Your goal is not to become the wife's realtor. You want to become the homeowner's realtor. Or if you speak only to the husband, then you leave out the wife and you're the husband's realtor. And the next thing you know, when there's a disagreement, it's you and that realtor. You don't want that. You want to become the family realtor. And even in divorce situations, mm -hmm. we see this uh, magnified. And how do you go about a, a, a conversation with somebody that's in divorce that they obviously don't see eye to eye. And if you become one or the other's real estate professional, you have made a fundamental mistake because you need both signatures, you need both cooperation. And so you'll, you're walking a very delicate balance between um, connecting with maybe what the person, the, the person that might be the final decision maker uh, in the process or the overall decision maker but not leaving the other person out. This is why our technology is so helpful today. Conference calls and Zoom calls and meetings in person with, with, both, with all parties is so helpful because you can look them in the eye and say, does this work for you, sir? Does this work for you, ma'am? Does this work for you, husband, and wife? And you can have that conversation uh, rather than just focusing on one person at the end of the day, the other person's like, I don't want to hire that person because all they did is look at you. That's kind of weird and, mm -hmm. and awkward. Mm -hmm. um, aren't, aren't, isn't that person here to serve our needs, not just one person? So I think that's really important that you know who you're meeting with. Yeah. 
and it's important then that you don't meet with only one party. And then you, you know, you think about it, you know, Wendy, you and I have both been doing this about 17 years and we've had the privilege of serving over a thousand families. Uh, we've done this appointment hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. And maybe a seller has never sold their home once. If you only meet with one person, you meet with the husband, not the wife, you meet with the wife, not the husband, you meet with the brother, not the sister, um, whoever it might be that, that's on title. And then in some sense, we expect that person to take all of that insight, all that knowledge, all that information that you've shared, that you've accumulated of decades of, of helping homeowners sell their home and decades of communicating this and then you ask them, the spouse, to share it with the other spouse. It doesn't work. What a disaster. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I always tell my wife, there are certain things I, I'll talk to my wife, and there are certain things I'll have somebody else talk to her about. Because it's coming from them. <laughs> mm -hmm. This is just too real, but right. it's, it's reality. And there are some things that, that you may say, no, no, you go ahead and share with my spouse. So don't meet with just one person. Make sure both of them are available. And you can reschedule, and you can use technology, and you can a Zoom or, or conference call, um, reschedule the appointment, do it at the office, do it at the house, whatever, but you want to have all parties there. It's sort of our non-negotiable, one of those It is, it, and it has to be your non-negotiable, because yeah. if you rush that process, you damage the, the likelihood that you're going to take the listing, and even more importantly, you damage the process for them. They're not going to go through this very often, and nobody forgets their last move. And you damage the process for them. You damage it because you took all that insight and then required the spouse to share with the other spouse that evening after they come home tired and exhausted from work. What a disaster. Mm -hmm. So schedule a time where you can have a conversation with both of them. So let's go to present. Uh, so that was kind of some things that we think about before we show up. Uh, let me talk to you about this. Um, be prepared. I talked to, earlier about knowing the market, knowing the comparables, knowing what's happening in the community. Uh, and I always, you know, and around our team, we've got about 50 team members, and I'm always saying, never tell and sell. Stop being so verbal and show and share. Don't tell and sell. Nobody wants to hear the market is good or the market is bad or, mm -hmm. or the market's different. No, articulate what's really happening by showing them something. That could be something from your multiple listing. That could be something that you've created to watch and monitor the market. But it's important that you show and share and never tell and sell. Um, Wendy, any other comments on being prepared? Mm. Well, we always have uh, lots of material that we bring. Yeah. The other thing that we always are prepared with is we bring a listing agreement every time um, because we, we do, the expectation is to take the listing if our clients are ready for that. That's right. We went on one a couple years ago and together we went together and our conversation was, I don't, you know, I think this is, they're just looking for a home value uh, report and we haven't, we had helped them sell uh, in the past and we had no idea that they were going to move to Ireland. Yes. And it was, wow. And so when we left, it's like, thank goodness we had that. They were so ready to go, and we had no idea. And, and we so. set, uh, that's a great point. We set a lot of what we call fuller value reports. We come out, we give them an update on the value. The fuller idea is it's more comprehensive than what they get in a Zestimate online. Mm -hmm. And we set a lot of these appointments um, that it's just an update on value. And it's amazing how the conversation changes. Yep. Oh, I'm just thinking about refinancing. Would you tell me my value? Sure, we'll come over. And you show up and they're like, wow, if that's what I have in equity, why don't we make that move? We've been wanting to move to Sacramento. We've been wanting to move to Texas, Idaho, Nevada. Uh, we've been wanting to make the move to Tennessee. And the conversation changes. And pretty soon you do have a listing agreement, even though they said, all I want to know is my home value. Right. And so we do a lot of those appointments and we call them nurturers. Some are ready today and some may never be ready and some are we're nurturing to be ready and those we might need to nurture and provide them periodic updates on value yeah. and they shouldn't be dependent on a one page printout on zillow that doesn't know the neighborhood the community the upgrades it doesn't 
know even where the track is to know whether you're on the right or wrong side of the track. It has no idea. It just takes an algorithm based on some of the sales in the community and doesn't take into consideration so many things. A local real estate professional that has a pulse on the market is the best equipped to ascertain market value for a property. Mm -hmm. So timely, I wanna talk about this because I think this is one that people often forget about. Being timely is really important. Uh, one of my pet peeves, if you will, is people who arrive late. I run my schedule pretty tight. I often run it on 15 minute increments. Somebody shows up five, seven minutes late, you know, they might say something like, yeah, I'm casually on time or I'm casually late. I'll tell you what, that's offensive for a lot of people. So being timely is important. I'll often uh, watch my clock and if I'm going to meet at four o'clock, and it's at, at 3.59, I'm at their doorstep. And when it hits four, I knock on the door. Mm -hmm. And I've had, I cannot tell you how people said, you're right on time. Mm -hmm. And that starts the conversation. That starts and it help. You show up 10 minutes late, you know, because you're casually showing up. You're casually arriving. You want to be casually late. You kind of think that might be cool or whatever or contemporary. You're going to irritate some people. Uh, and you're, now you're in a hole you got to build back credibility just to get to a neutral place to communicate whatever you brought. And so be on time. I mean, be exactly, not a minute behind. There are people that, you know, I walk up to a house and all the lights are on in the home. Mm -hmm. And the wife or husband has vacuumed the carpet in such a way that the lines are perfect. Mm -hmm. I show up five minutes late. It's disrespectful for it them. It's disrespectful. So show up on time, be prepared. And that may mean you got to get there 20 minutes early. And to know the market may mean that you need to pop by several other of the homes that are for sale. So you could say, oh, no, I've walked through that property. And let me tell you what kind of upgrades that it has. Oh, I've been through that home. Let me tell you what the agent told me about that comparable. And you can be knowledgeable, but you got to be on time. And it's so critical um, it, we are not in, a, in an environment where you can show up even a moment late and have to rebuild that credibility, especially as you might have brushed shoulders with two or three other agents coming in or out, and they're interviewing one after another, and then you show up late. So be there on time. Now, also don't show up early. You know, don't show up five minutes or ten minutes early to the appointment. Because you show up five minutes early, and you know, I was on an appointment the other day and they've got a bunch of little kids running. Like that is a major inconvenience if I show up five minutes early. Or even worse, maybe the spouse isn't home. You show up five minutes or 10 minutes early and they're like, okay, come on in, but you can wait over there until he or she gets home. Mm -hmm. And I usually say, no, no, I'll just sit out in my truck until they arrive just so that we can start the conversation with everybody being present. And in some sense, I'm not alone with that person in their home. And um, I probably be a little old fashioned that way. I just think that it affords people a measure of respect and comfortability. And then when the husband comes in or the wife comes home, then I'm ready to continue the conversation. So don't be early. Don't be late. Be right on time. Be timely on this listing appointment. And I like that when Wendy always says that it's like a job interview. Each time you meet with someone, it's a job interview. So put your best foot forward. You wouldn't arrive late to a job interview. You wouldn't arrive unprepared. And so have be ready be ready to go and to win it yeah and that matters you know for some people they'll be like hey no problem but for other people it matters deeply yeah and they're gonna you're gonna be in a hole and have to dig out of that hole before you can get to a neutral ground to even have a conversation and then you want to be attentive and this is why i'm not an advocate of having a completely scripted listing presentation uh, because what happens is when it's completely scripted, I mean, from, from top to bottom, what happens is we're not attentive. We're concentrating on our things, on what we need to say, and we're not listening for keywords of what others are saying. I'll never forget, uh, I asked one of, the, one of the questions we're going to recommend that you ask is, what anxiety or what concerns do you have about the sale of your home? And then I pause. It's not a script. It's just a question that I ask. And somebody made a comment uh, several years ago and said, you're the third agent in my house. Interviewing agents, you're number three. Nobody has asked me that question. And he said, all I really care about is do you absolutely have to use a lockbox? And I said, 
No? Okay, we'd like to go ahead and hire you. And nobody ever paused long enough to find out what mattered to them. Interesting. They followed their scripts so much. Mm -hmm. And you know this happens and they might say, do I really have to do an open house? Do I really need to do a for sale sign? It, and that's their concern. We're thinking about the 3D Matterport tour that we're planning to do, the drone footage. And they're like, do I really have to have a for sale sign in my yard? And then when you say no, and you listen to them, then you can adapt. So that takes having a track, not a script. A track gets those questions to come about in the right timing and moves you down to the ultimate end of that conversation. A script doesn't pay attention to what the person across the table is saying. You're just trying to memorize what you, what you have on your mind or what you tell. And people see through it today. Mm -hmm. And the moment you say, how can I best help you today? And you pause, and yet you're equipped that whatever response comes out, doesn't matter what they say, you can answer it because you're well prepared. Mm -hmm. And that goes along with your serving. Like when you're serving, you're listening and you, you're attending to their needs. So that's so smart. Sometimes people are so scripted that they feel like they have to just get through their entire script and they get thrown off uh, because they are so, so scripted true. that they, and then they have to, they feel like they have to get to the end, right? And somebody might be ready to, to move forward even without getting to the end, but they, the, they feel like they have to get to the end. And it's, so it's really not about you. Again, it's really about them. Yes. And so you have to be smart about that and you have to take the cues of when it's time to switch into That's right. their direction, That's, not your direction. I can, I'll never forget one of the very first listing appointments I went on. I was taught to have a script and I was given a binder of certain pages to always cover no matter what. And the seller gets out his pen and he begins as I'm talking, tapping on the table. <laughs> he, he's done with hearing all about the company and about the marketing plan and you know how long I've been in the business and about the company I was with and all the locations and all the other agents we have and the CEO and all the stuff. And he's just tapping. And later on, I realize he's tapping because he's ready to sign. Hmm. And in some sense, somebody once taught me never sell with blah, 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 if all it takes is blah. Right? Like you, don't, <laughs> you don't have to go mm -hmm. cover what matters to them. Yeah. Use a track, not a script. A script gets them where they're ready to sign and you're still talking about how great you are. A, a track moves you along at a steady pace and allows you the ability to adapt and overcome any questions, concerns, and provide relevant solutions. Remember, selling 101 is simply they have a problem and you have a solution. So before you start describing the myriad of solutions that we think we have, maybe you ask what their problem is. What are they trying to accomplish? And now you can respond poignantly. You can respond clearly and concisely to what they're doing. That's great. So what's uh, your follow-up then? All right. So then the next, so we got pre, we got present, and we got post. So what's your plan afterwards to follow up? Not everybody's ready right away. And now that may, might mean they need to get pre-approved to buy the next home. It might mean that they need to make some preparations before they can sell. It might mean they need to talk to their lender or their insurance company or their solar company and before they feel comfortable. It might mean that they want to talk to some other family members. That's all cool, right? Uh, what's important then is you follow up. And here's the secret to follow up. It is so simple. It And we make it so complicated. You know, we'll get these drip campaigns and they're, you know, 40, 40 drip, 40 emails, 40 texts later. And it's as simple as this. When you follow up, every time you follow up, when you end, you end with another appointment. Hmm. And so, Christine, if I was to follow up with you, I might say, uh, Christine, I know you're going to talk to your husband tonight. I know you're going to talk to your family. I know you're going to talk to the bank. I know you're going to finish getting pre-approved. Would it be acceptable if I followed up with you tomorrow, maybe around 4 o'clock, or would 5 be better for you? And then when I follow up with Christina, then I have the conversation like, okay, Rick, we didn't really get a chance to have that conversation, but we're going to do it tonight. Oh, that's no problem, Christina. Can I call you tomorrow at 10 or would 11 be better? I just end every appointment on an appointment. If you do that, mm -hmm. you, you don't need a lengthy drip campaign. There's nothing wrong with those. But 
it will keep you on track and it will always produce great follow-up. And it produces great follow-up based on their timing. If I talk to you, Christine, say, you know what? We're not gonna be able to meet for the next week. My husband's out of town. I need to do a little bit more research. I'm getting pre-approved. I'm not gonna be available to do that this weekend. So then I might say, well, can I follow up with you by the end of the week? Mm -hmm. Or would Monday be better, right? And so I can pace out that timing so that it's appropriate. And all of that is really part of having the pulse. This is the stuff that I, we didn't learn in our first year, mm -hmm. right? In the first year, you get a binder, you say, this is how you do it. This is the stuff you learn after serving over a thousand people, mm -hmm. going on these appointments over a thousand times, is that there's a cadence that you've got to stay on. If you're on that cadence and on that rhythm, you, do, you, you portray a level of professionalism and confidence and clarity. Great leaders are great simplifiers. Take the complexity of selling their home and bring it down to some simple solutions. You'll, you'll see a lot of, as we go through, there are three things you need to do. You know, there's only four steps to this process. Great leaders are great simplifiers. Let's simplify it. So follow up, follow up. The money is in the follow up. The money is in the nurturing. Nurture them along. And when they are ready, they will, they will let you know and you can get back out there, sign the list. Mm -hmm. Great. So let's talk about the content and what that looks like. Okay. So we believe in a four step track, not script. Track. Now you can have parts of you can have parts of this scripted. Many of the things I'll share with you I have memorized, but we want to move for a track. And you'll see the track L I S T lead in investigate show sell tie down. And the first thing is lead in. You know what's amazing? Even today, Wendy, in 2020, going into 2021, with all the technology and all the resources and all the vetting sites of Zillow and Yelp and Google. People still want to work with people that have three qualities. They like them, they know them, and they trust them. Now, you might show up because they found you on Google or Yelp or Zillow, or that even you're referred by a family member, and they trust you because of that referral, but they don't know you. They may not even like you yet. So a lead-in gives you an opportunity to get to know them. So the very first thing that we do in the lead-in is I find some point of connection. If I'm walking up and they've got a boat on the side of the house and I like to boat, I might say, hey, I love your boat. Where do you take it? Uh, if I walk up and I notice that they have a license plate from Oregon and my wife's from Oregon, I might say, hey, I know your Oregon license plate. I'm looking for a connection mm -hmm. to build a relationship. Uh, I'm not going to stay there long. We're, but we're going to make a connection. And occasionally, you find that it's, uh, you can't find any of those things. There's no boat on the side of the house. There's no, nothing that makes a connection. Maybe it's a community that you haven't been in in a while. And so we use this simple for uh, acronym FORD to help do that. And so I'll often remember that. And being a, personally, being an introvert, this can be helpful to me. And if I need to, to break the ice, if I need to build some lead in, I might think forward. Family, occupation, recreation, dreams, right? Or commonalities. And so I might say something like, um, hey, I see the nice photos on the wall. Uh, who's in the picture? That's family, right? They start talking about their family. Or I might say, uh, hey, I noticed that you pulled up in your, your utility truck. What line of business are you in? Oh, you're in that business? I know something. And there's a connection. I might say something about recreation. I noticed that you have a motorhome or camper on the side of your house. Where do you like to go? I'm just trying to build a connection. Or I might say dreams. Oh, I see the Disneyland or the Hawaii trip or the Florida trip that you have, you know, that picture. Uh, where, where did you go? What was that like? Where are you planning to go this year? Any plans for the summertime? These family occupation, recreation, dreams takes a situation where you don't have a lot to work with and helps you begin to lead in, just lead into the relationship and break the ice. And a great way to do that is to, to bring in the referral, whoever referred you. Uh, the majority of our business is by referral. It's past clients that were satisfied that referred their neighbor. They referred a family member or friend. We help the parent. Now we're helping the child. We are the 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 uh, their son or daughter. Uh, we're helping you know the grandparent, the aunt and uncle, and the cousins and the whole family. 
And so you want to bring in metaphorically the referral into the room. And I might say something like this, Wendy, uh, so looking forward to working with you. Uh, Christina thought you and I might be a great fit. Or one of the reasons why Christina thought I might be a great fit is, and I'm bringing Christina into the conversation. See, because Christina in some sense becomes the, new, the third party that says, you like Christina, I like Christina, we're here as a result of we both have a relationship with Christina, let's bring Christina into this conversation. And so great to have you here. One of the reasons why Christina might want me to talk to you is because of whatever, right? And it, we bring the referral into that conversation. Our team does that all the time. And they'll say something like, you know, when Rick and I go on this appointment, I'm not in the room. Or when Rick and I list homes, I'm not in the room, but they'll bring me a part of it because they've, they've seen that I've sold other properties in their neighborhood and we have some credibility, or maybe they know me from the neighborhood or the community or the area or the city or whatever, and that builds credibility. And that lead-in is so important. And if you're not careful, this one, you have to, you have, to have a really good pulse on how long to be in lead-in. If you go at it and you're too long, it's weird, it's awkward, it's uncomfortable. If you're too short, and I err on the side of being too short, you know, I show up at an appointment, I need to be gone in 30 minutes, and so I sometimes make these parts the shortest. And if I'm not careful, I haven't developed enough relationship equity. There's no equity in our relationship to draw on to say, this is what I think the home value is, and there's some level of liking, knowing, and trusting that's occurring in that relationship. So lead-in is always our first step. You're, of course, arriving on time, coming, arriving and prepared, you're attentive, and you're getting to know them. And these are all things that end with a question mark. Uh, I see that you've been to Disneyland. What's your next family vac vacation? Question mark. Uh, I see you have a motor home, and where do you like to go? Question mark, right? Uh, occupation, I see that you pulled up in a utility truck. Uh, what is it that you do? Question, like all of them are question marks. And one of the things that we find with real estate professionals or even in some sense sales professional in any environment, the best salespeople are not the most talkative. They just end the conversation with a question mark and that gives them insight in how to adapt and adjust this track to cover what matters most to that person. You mentioned, that you, said, you mentioned oh, 30 <laughs> minutes. What's like the average time that a listing presentation should take? I rarely are am I on a listing appointment for more than an hour. Right. Maybe. You used to schedule for 45 minutes. I used to do 45 minutes. Yeah. Sometimes I'm in a unique situation where it might go to like an hour and five. Um, but but nor, And I'll usually do, and we'll talk about this later on, where we do what we call a safe island, where I tell them what's next, mm -hmm. where I tell them what they can expect. Like we're on this island together I take them out of this choppy water and we look at the horizon and say, okay, we're gonna go here and then we're gonna go there, we're gonna go here. And I'll say, today, I'll be here for about 30 minutes or so and I plan to cover these things. And does that sound fair enough for you, Wendy? Does that yeah. sound fair enough to you, Christina? And he goes, oh, that sounds great. And I set the precedence. I'm not gonna be there for four hours. I'm not expecting them to invite me over for dinner. I'm not waiting for them to bring out cookies and ice cream, right? We're, we're moving through on this track methodically, uh, very, very specific on what I'm trying to accomplish, but yet I do want to build that relationship equity. If I don't have it and I get to suggestions, advice, consulting, then what does it matter? They don't trust me. Mm -hmm. So I need to build this relationship equity. And sometimes this takes me two, three minutes, and sometimes it might be 15 or 20, mm -hmm. and depending on how much equity I need to build with them. And you got to be careful because if you know the person, and I see this so often with real estate professionals, they'll go out on an appointment with somebody they know, and this becomes the bulk of the conversation, the lead-in. And they never got to the investigate. They never got to the show and sell. They never got to the tie down. And, okay, well, we should get to real estate conversation. You've been here for two hours. You've had coffee, tea. You've got <laughs> cookies. What, like, what else do you want? Let's talk about this. And they don't know how to get to it. So by setting the precedence and following this track, it works. Mm -hmm. Do you have any tips, Wendy? What do you do? Oh, I just, um, just to piggyback on, on what Rick said is we've been on a lot of appointments together 
And just setting up that timing in advance really works. Yeah. And you've always said, what are the top three things that are concerning you or things that you're thinking about or that worry you or how can, how can I help you best in the next 45 minutes? Yeah. And then when you ask that question, it lets them tell you exactly where they want to go and what's on their mind. Um, rather than you trying to guess, you know, where you should be going and crafting things and moving around them. So, and it's just very, it's very natural and it's also, it's respectful. Um, you're there for them, not for yourself. Right. And to spit out your presentation on somebody, um, really it's all about them. The other thing that I've seen uh, agents make mistakes doing is, is really going and talking all about themselves. Yes. Um, I love to go camping and, you know, I took my family here and there and, you know, and, and that's a mistake. It is. Um, because they don't want to hear about you. Um, you're not there for them to hear about you. Yeah. Uh, so I've seen that too. So that you just got to be careful of that. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. I love that because it's basically like the way that you conduct the conversations how I perceive how you're going to conduct your business. If it's all about you, it's going to be all about you. You're not going to put me first, my home first. Um, you're here for your commission. And so when you actually show you care about me, oh, you've won mm. my heart. So <laughs> that's so true. Yeah. And that's how you develop relationships that create legacy. You know, they say, this is not just my, this is my parents' realtor. This is my cousin's realtor. This is my uncle's realtor, all my neighbors. Everybody that goes to my church use, how do you do that? Where does that come from? It comes from an attentiveness on what they need. Mm -hmm. It comes on recognizing their concerns. It doesn't come by you just articulating a script that you've memorized. Mm -hmm. It brings a humanity in, and that's awesome. Well, and that's, that leads us to the, what we call the I, which is investigate. And this is really, really important that you ask great questions. And I like questions that go deep, not shallow conversation questions. So you might ask a question and then ask them, uh, tell me more about that. Or um, give me a little bit more insight on that. Or why is that important to you? And the best place to have these discussions is not on the sofa. It's not while the TV is blaring in the background. It's not in their backyard patio, you know, when it's freezing outside or it, in the Bay Area, it's over 100 degrees. The best place to have this conversation is at their kitchen or dining room table. Okay, that, when you get to the kitchen and dining room table, that is when you know that, that you're at a place where people can concentrate and at a place where if they choose to move forward, they're in a place to sign. They're not moving forward when they're kicking back in their lazy boy or on their rocking chair watching TV and you're competing with CNN or Fox News, yeah. right? Like you, they're not paying attention to you. And the challenge is you got you to gotta direct it to the kitchen table or the dining room table and you got to direct it tactfully, okay? Which means you might want to say, and I use this script all the time, I'll say something along the lines of, I brought a lot of information for you. Would it be acceptable to use your dining room or kitchen table? And usually I've figured out which one I want to be at as we've walked through their home. And I'm walking through the property, I'm looking at everything, I'm asking them, uh, what do you plan to do to the home? How do you plan to prepare the home? Uh, did you make that upgrade or did somebody else? Did you have that done professionally? And I'm asking all these questions and we finally get through walking through the entire property. I'm then going to say, uh, would it be acceptable if I we used your kitchen table, your dining room table, because I brought a lot of information for you? And that tends to be an easy, tactful way to say, oh, you brought some information? Sure, let's use our kitchen table. When you come up to the kitchen table, it's important that you know where to sit. Uh, if you're not careful, you'll sit in his or her favorite chair. Or that's where grandma sits when she's here. <laughs> and the whole time you're talking to them, they're thinking that you're in the wrong chair. <laughs> Nobody sits in that chair. You know, mom sits in that chair. Dad sits in that chair. Uh, you know, uncle sits in that chair only. And, and they're thinking about it. So you got to be really tactful about where you sit. You also have to be very tactful of where you ask them to sit. It's their table, but you want to provide some direction. Here's what I found. If I don't provide some direction, I will almost always get one seller to sit over here and one seller to sit way over here. 
And you know what I'm doing the whole time? I'm playing tennis. In comparison, when I say, would it be acceptable if I sit here and maybe the two of you would sit here, whether it's brother, sister, two brothers, uh, husband and wife, would you, the two of you sit here, and now I can look at them and I can look eye to eye to both person, they're looking at each other, and I can typically say something like, uh, does that sound fair enough for you? And I'm looking at both of them, instead of doing the ping pong and the tennis back and forth. And if, you're, if you let it, if you let them who've not sold their home, or maybe they've sold just a couple of homes before and they don't know the process, and if you let them take control in the process, they will sit at one end of the table and you'll sit at the other, and you'll become the wife's realtor, the husband's realtor, you'll become the brother's realtor, the sister's realtor, but not the family realtor. You want to become the family realtor. And by having them sit together, and you can do it tactfully by saying, would you mind if I sit here? Maybe the two of you could sit there. Would that be okay? And you do that tactfully. And you say, oh, yeah, that'll be just fine. That might not be the original where they like to sit. They might, we might kind of put them a little out of place. But now I can look at both of them, and I can get the two of them to look together at one another and say, yeah, I think that's what I want to do. Yeah, let's go ahead and get the ball rolling. Yeah, let's go ahead and get started. That sounds reasonable to us. And so where they sit at the dining room table after walking through the property is important. It's not enough to let this happen by happenstance. If you do, you'll be at the kitchen counter. Uh, if you do, you'll be in the backyard. If you do, they'll be watering their lawn, listening to you out of the, you know, their left ear. If you do, you'll be competing with the, you know, the competing news stations. You want to avoid all of that. This is the biggest financial decision. You came prepared. You're, you've, you're timely. You're attentive. Take 15 minutes, get them at the table and have this conversation. And this is after you walk through the home. First thing you're going to do, you're going to walk in the front door. Always ask them if you should remove your shoes. There are certain cultures, certain people, certain families that, and sometimes when, I, when, when we had little kids at home, like everybody had to remove their shoes uh, because we knew that, car, that mud would be drugged through the carpet. We had a light color carpet. So somebody who comes in and they just barge in and they ever ask to remove the shoes. That's what they're thinking about when they're at the table with you. So pause long enough, say, should I, and I just like the assumptive approach. So I don't make people feel weird. I say, should I leave my shoes here or would outside be better? You know, in the entry or outside? And then you just, oh, no, no, don't worry about it. Are you sure? Yeah. Fine. And now I can continue. And then I'll simply say, before we get started, would you mind showing me around the home? And then we're walking through the property and I'm always asking, uh, are you planning to do anything in here? I'm just listening, not even giving them any advice on this. Do you plan to do anything in this room? Do you plan to do anything with this? Do you plan to, did you install this or did you have it professionally done? Uh, is this something the house came with or did you add it? I'm just having this conversation, getting to know the property. You're looking at your tax records and the house is 4,000 square feet. You're walking through it and you're like, this thing's no more than 1,200 square feet. You better know that before you get to the conversation about pricing of the property. Once you set the wrong price, you're in big trouble. So walk through the property, then go to that dining room table I talked about. Take the lead. Do you mind if I sit here and maybe the two of you could sit here? Would that be okay? Do it tactfully. And now you're off to have a great conversation about what they're interested in doing. And the first thing we want you to do is after you've investigated the property, we want you to investigate the seller or the homeowner. And what I mean by investigate, I'm not asking you to go through their dresser drawers, but I want you to start asking them, dream with them a little bit. What are you trying to accomplish? Where are you planning to move to? See, they don't want to sell their home. They want to buy another. They don't want to sell their home. They want to move out of state. They don't want to sell their home. They want a new school district. See, the selling the home is just a means to an end. I need to know what the end is. It's not that they just want to sell their house. It's that we want to move into a bigger house, a smaller home, this community, that community, house with a pool, whatever. So I've got to discover what that looks like. So I really have the why that I can pull on later on to say, Wendy, if we are going to help you get into that community, the one with the pool on a golf course, it's a gated community, we're really going to have to price it right. Mm -hmm. Wendy, if you are going to move into that community, nestled in the beautiful mountains like you described on five acres, we're really going to have to have the marketing plan. Wendy, if you're really going to make this move into a home that has a, a pool and all of the amenities that you've described that's a 
five bedroom instead of the three. We're going to move from the condo to the town, from the condo and townhome to the estate. If you're really going to do that, Wendy, we've got to prepare it properly, right? So we want to use not to sell the house, to sell the house, to sell the house, to sell the house. But what's the end goal? The selling of the house is not what they want. That just helps them accomplish what they set out to accomplish. If we really want to finalize this divorce, we want to make sure we price it right. If we really want to make sure that we get the highest possible price for the beneficiaries on this probate, we're going to need to price it right. So we want to use the why in part of our discussion to remind them of why you've invited me over to the home in the first place and it wasn't to sell the home. It's one of the biggest mistakes realtors make. I'm here to sell your house. No, I don't wanna sell my house. I just wanna buy another and it requires that I sell my house. And if I don't sell my house, I can't afford to buy the next one. So what's the real motivation? That's why when you leave, they jump on Zillow or your website and they're looking for property. So it ain't about the sale of their home. It's like, okay, that's just what I need to do in order to accomplish my dream. Sometimes they don't know. That's exactly Sometimes right. Sometimes they don't know why. Uh, sometimes they need to talk it out with you there yep. to figure out what the why is. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the why for one spouse is different than the why for the other. Hmm. So um, that was an appointment I went on last night yep. coming from two, two different places. So you can help them walk through that. Too. That's right. And um, yeah. So. so once you've investigated the property, you're going to investigate the seller. The order is important. The investigating the property helps you get to know them, helps you build a relationship with them. You know, when you're walking through the house and, oh, I love how you decorate it, right? It, it begins to open up this relationship. And then you have enough relationship equity to say, tell me what you're trying to accomplish. How can I best help you? And that's one of my favorite questions to ask. In the investigation stage, I love to ask them, how can I best help you today? Or I might take it a little deeper and say, in the next 30 minutes or so, what would you like to get out of our conversation? Setting the precedence of how long my, my time is going to be, and I'm getting to the heart of the matter. And I'll hear things like this. Rick, we just can't decide whether we want to sell it or rent it. You've heard people say that. So do I want to spend my entire time talking about the Zillow ads that I run or the Matterport tour? Or, no, I want to start then saying, well, I need to take this track. And I need to take it to the direction of you need to discover whether to rent it or to sell it. Let's take a moment to talk about that. Oh, you're right, Rick. It doesn't make sense for us to rent it. Let's sell it. And I'm solving the problem they have. That's important because oftentimes for most people, we don't even listen to hear what the problem is before we start providing solutions. We've got a dozen solutions and no problem. Find the problem, give them the right solution, and you'll become that legacy realtor, one that represents them and all their family members for generations. So I love the how can I best help you today. I love the question, uh, taking it a little further, in the next 30 minutes, what can I how can I best help you? In light of all that I do and know and, and the research I've done on the market, what's the one question that you have today? Wendy referenced another question that I love to ask at this phase. We're sitting down at the dining room table. Uh, thank you so much for the tour. Um, what are the top three things you're concerned about selling the home? You will be surprised what people say. Mm -hmm. It's the first, I'm concerned about the sale sign. Do I really have to do an open house every weekend? What about showing the home? How do I show it, right? And now you've found out what they're really concerned about and you can incorporate that in part of your presentation and your discussion. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, and of course you wanna cover finances and their next home, I think I mentioned that. Are you pre-approved? Where are you planning to buy? Remember, uh, most of us belong to national or international networks that we can provide real estate agents all across the country or maybe you need to bring with you a few other homes that are for sale in the community that they're interested in and, an and, a, and your in-house lender, your preferred lender, so that they can get pre-approved. And that's important. And so knowing those answers and asking those questions about where they're moving are critically important. That's great. It's like you said, doing your homework ahead of time. You have to know, you have to be prepared, expect anything to be asked and then, you know, whether they should rent or sell. And so you need your pulse on the market, which is great. 
So the next step after we covered lead in, we've investigated first, first the property, then the seller. And now we're at a place where we want to show and sell. Never tell and sell. Show and sell. A picture is worth a thousand words. In real estate, I would tell you a picture is worth thousands of dollars. And so bring something that you can show them and rather than just telling them. Uh, it really bothers me when agents will say something like, the market's good, the market's bad, the market's different. Oh, the market's great, or the market's excellent. What do you think about buying? It's a great market. Think about selling, it's a great market. That's how we lose credibility. That's how we lose <laughs> yeah. authenticity. Is it a buyer's market or a seller's market? Well, what do you want to do? I want to sell. <laughs> then it's a seller's market, of course. <laughs> you lose credibility when you do that. Yeah. But when you come to somebody and say, let me share with you what I brought for you today, and you show them and then you share with them how that is relevant and affects them, oh, they love it. You gotta take the abstract and make it simple. Great leaders are great simplifiers. Based on what's happening in the market, it's a great time to sell your home lately because the average home's on the market for less than two weeks. They're getting more in the sales price than what they are in the list price. And right now for every three homes that have sold, there's only two for sale. It's a great market. Right? This is a perfect time to do what you want to do. And that, that show and sell rather than tell and sell is so much more effective. And the first thing I think you want to do in this phase, this is right after the investigation. These are sequential strategies. This is a sequential track. Is you want to take them on the safe island. And so the safe island might look a little something like this. I might say, Wendy, in the next 35 minutes or so, uh, let me take a minute and share with you what's going to happen. Is that fair enough for you? Mm -hmm. And Wendy, before I start, I want to share with you that uh, today I have discovered that there are only three things that it takes to sell a home. And so I'll walk you through how to best price your home, how to best present your home, and how to position it on the market with the best marketing material. Because I found that if we do those three things together and we do them well, then this conversation will be very, very beneficial and you'll get the highest possible price with the least amount of inconvenience in a reasonable amount of time. So in the next 30, 35 minutes, can we focus on those three topics? That sounds great. And that's called a safe island because they have no idea what you're gonna say or what you're gonna do or wh what's the table of contents for our conversation? What's the agenda for our conversation? We're just gonna sit here and talk about the PTA the whole time? We're gonna talk about the neighborhood, the community, what we saw on the news coming over? So you take them through this safe island and what happens is the anxiety and stress of like, I got this realtor in my home, which is stressful for people. Why do you think they vacuum yeah. and they have those back? And you, and you sit back and say, you know, let me just kind of tell you what I, how I expect this conversation to go. Does this sound fair enough for you? We're going to cover these three things. Does that sound reasonable? And they're like, well, yeah, I want the highest price. I want the least amount of inconvenience and I want to sell in a reasonable amount of time. Great. Let me tell you what we need to do to make that happen. This safe island takes them from very choppy, uncertain, uh, uh, uneven waters, puts them on the safe island, says this is the horizon, and this is how we're getting from point A to point B. Point B is wrapping up the conversation. Does that sound fair enough to you? This is how we're going to navigate it. And that's your GPS, and we call it a safe island. And then I like to talk just for a moment about the team. Wendy's absolutely right. You come in and you're only talking about yourself, Weird, awkward, egotistical. There's a lot of scripts that do that that just they don't sit well with me. But you can talk about the team. And we bring what we call a portfolio. And this portfolio is much like a brochure. And it walks through the basic uh, components of the team and the basic attributes of the team. It looks like Christina has it here. This is a portfolio that we have in a written format. And the first thing that it's going to cover uh, as we scroll through, you're going to see that there's a little history or a story about our team. I'll we'll go ahead and stop right there, Christina. Mm -hmm. And this is a personal story. It's our why. It's a story of my wife and I buying our first home, having an amazing decision because it was going up in value so much and we were able to paint it the color we wanted. We were, we were adding to reducing the principal balance every time we make a payment but yet it describes a frustrating experience of buying that first home. Amazing decision, discouraging and disappointing process. So it tells the story of how 
that birthed in us the why to commit our, our professional life to helping our clients have the kind of experience they're excited to tell a friend about. It's our very roots. It's what we do. Every decision is based on it. And so we realize that moving is an unforgettable experience. Everybody remembers their last move. And our goal, our purpose, our mission, like why we woke up this morning and came to the office, why we're here at your house today is to provide you the kind of experience that you're excited to tell a friend about. That's it. Nothing more, nothing less. That's my goal. And uh, so we kind of walk through that the American dream doesn't have to be the American nightmare, <laughs> that we can help you have the kind of experience that you're excited to tell a friend about. Uh, we'll also talk about, go ahead and scroll down a little bit, Christina, and we'll kind of scroll through this a little bit. We'll talk about our team. And we'll talk that we're an endorsed local provider, that we're ranked the number one real estate team in the San Francisco Bay Area and Sacramento County. That together we have over 75 years of combined real estate experience. We'll talk about us having nearly a thousand five-star reviews. And I'm always trying to talk about things that are relevant for them. So if I might say something like, you know, Wendy, if, if I'm with you, Wendy, on an appointment, I might say something like, Wendy, uh, we're an endorsed local provider. And what that means to you is that we have the heart of a teacher, as Dave Ramsey likes to say. Uh, I might say we've got nearly a thousand five-star reviews. And what that means for you is that a thousand people have had the kind of experience they're excited to tell a friend about. I might say that we're ranked number one in the San Francisco Bay Area in Sacramento County. And Wendy, what that means for you is we got a really good pulse on the market and how to best present properties for sale, right? It's not about those accolades. It's about what the accolades means to that person. If you're not careful, then you go, oh, we're this and I'm that and this and that. Those are, they don't care about that. But if you say, well, Wendy, by being the number one real estate team in the San Francisco Bay Area in Sacramento County, we have well over 20 buyer specialists, all with a list of buyers readily available to look, in, look at your home. We make it relevant to them. And this, I think, is one of the important parts that we talk about the why. Simon Sinek did a podcast, uh, pardon me, a TED Talk, where he talks about starting with why. The why becomes the mission of who you are. It's your compelling story. And the more you can articulate that, st that story clearly, concisely, uh, the more they're like, wow, I want to be a part of that story. Uh, that's where I want to be. The more you talk about how and what you do, the less impact you have. When you get to the why and you package it in a nice story, compelling story, people remember it. So then we'll scroll down and we talk about our various offices because oftentimes we have team, we have clients that are moving from the San Francisco Bay Area to the Sacramento County uh, region, the Sacramento County area region. And so we talk about all the offices that we have in the Bay Area and Sacramento County and that we can serve them both here, both here and in the community that they're often moving to. And if they don't, if we don't have a team member in that area, we're happy to find real estate professional. I'll interview them for competence and you'll interview them for connection and we'll find a great agent that we can work with in an area that we don't cover. We'll talk a little bit about reviews. I'm amazed today uh, how little focus the real estate community and real estate professionals have on reviews. Uh, you wouldn't eat at a restaurant without reading the reviews. You wouldn't stay at a hotel or rent a car without reading the reviews. People are reading the reviews of real estate professionals before they entrust the greatest asset that they have. So get ahead of this. We have, near, we have over 500 five-star reviews online. We're, we're currently nearly at 1,000. We're the Dave Ramsey endorsed local provider. You can read about our client's experience on Yelp or Zillow or Google. And this helps articulate and sets them at ease. Maybe they said, let's meet a few agents, then we'll go online and see their reviews. And now I check that off their box, that's done. And they're in a position where they can make a decision. Most of the time when our sellers are thinking about selling, they're also thinking about buying. And so we talk about whether they should rent or whether they should buy. If they don't know where they're moving to, it'll often uh, slow down the process or cease the process of them selling the home. So we talk about how they're going to you know, why they may want to purchase a home instead of rent a property. We talk about what that looks like. 
in the show and sell phase, we also walk through, and you're going to see it here coming up next, what we call the fuller buying strategy. And it's a simplified roadmap. I told you my story about when I bought my first home. It was a great decision. It was a terrible process. Because for me, I never knew what was next. I never knew what the next step was. So I was always kind of in the dark. What does it mean to close escrow? What does it mean for escrow and home warranty and homeowner's insurance? I, I just didn't know those terms. And because I didn't know what was next, it made it a frustrating process. This tells them exactly what the next step is. We then talk about how we're going to prepare the home for sale. We talk about the fact that we have all of the vendors and contractors needed. So if they need paint, carpet, landscaping, uh, we can give them recommendations. It's what we call on our team, our RICS picks, and they can bring out, uh, we can bring out real uh, professionals that can help prepare the home for sale. And these are some of the things that we're looking for. What you should know about when you're preparing the home for sale, there are some areas of high importance, some areas of very low importance. The important thing is to help a homeowner define what's a high priority and what's a low priority. Your curb appeal, that is high priority. It's the first picture on every web portal. Your master uh, bathroom vanity cabinet, low priority. Homeowner doesn't know that. They'll spend their entire weekend organizing the master vanity cabinet and yet not do anything with the front, front yard landscaping. A buyer may purchase the home with not uh, ever opening that cabinet. I guarantee you that they're gonna walk, they're gonna walk up the front of the house. They're gonna walk through the front door. And so we wanna prioritize their time from high to high priority areas from low priority areas. Don't worry about that shed out back. I'm not too concerned about your garage, but your kitchen, Let's minimize, let's remove so many of the personal property items that are on the counter. It just looks better when we take pictures to have less is more. If when there's less items, the home looks bigger, it looks brighter and it looks better. That's what happens when there, we have less personal property throughout the house. And then we talk about our strategy and we've broken this into several phases of how we're going to sell the property. And what we realized is that some of our clients, they need what we call limited service. This is somebody who calls us and says, I've got a property that I wanna sell and I want my tenant to buy it. Okay, great. And that's what we call limited service. We don't need to run the ads and the flyer and put the flyers together and the Matterport tours and the fly the drone and all of the things that we do. And the seller is going to receive a commission reduction because they're in what we call limited service. We don't need to use our full service because they've already identified a buyer before we've ever got on the market. And maybe they call and say, I want to buy, I want to buy my, my uh, landlord's home. Or they might say, um, I want to, my, my brother and sister and I want to buy this property and I've already met the seller. It's not on the market. We already worked it out. We want to make the purchase. We want to buy that home. We already know what home it is. We already know the buyer and seller. But that's a limited. We don't need to do the marketing exposure uh, that we put so much of an investment into. You then have what we call a full service. And most of our clients utilize the full service. And the full service is all the things that we do as real estate professionals to serve them in the process. And that's called full service. Um, it includes all the marketing, the advertising. It includes the follow-up, what we call our Monday updates, where we communicate with them on a regularly, regular basis. And it, it's our full service platform. It provides the professional photography, the Matterport tours, 3D tours, floor plan extractions that we do. And then you have this service we call certified full service. And the idea on this platform is that this is the one that needs the home inspection, it needs the, the termite report, the roof inspection, prior to going on the market. And so this one has us where we purchase these items and then we use a certified full service in order to serve them. So the seller has three options. They could use limited, they could use full service, so they could use certified full service, whichever, which, whichever one is most appropriate for them. 
And that concludes our portfolio and a little bit about the team. And that helps them now know well, these guys are prepared. These guys have thought it through. These gals know the market, know our area. Anything else about the portfolio, Wendy? No, it's just got our marketing plan in there. It does have our marketing plan, yep. Yeah. Um, so many people, um, so many agents don't have a marketing plan to, to share with anybody. That's right. So they just sort of make it up as they go along. Uh, but that's why you're being hired, or one of the reasons yeah. why you're being hired. Well, it certainly is the biggest investment you're going to make yeah. in how you market their property. Yeah. Financial investment, uh, where do you plan to put it? What is it going to look like when you get it there? And so our marketing plan, which is detailed and in there and proven, because we've sold lots of other homes likely in their community, and they know that our marketing plan worked for those homes, it's going to work for my home. So once we've walked through, we're sitting at the kitchen table, we've done the safe island, we've looked at the environment, we've talked a little about the team, and then I like to, to reference that there are only three things it takes to sell the property for the highest possible price in a reasonable amount of time with the least amount of inconvenience. And those things are very simple. Number one is price, and it is the king of these three options. You get the wrong price, it doesn't matter how much marketing you have, it won't sell. So price is important. It's not what I think your home is worth. It's not what Wendy thinks your home is worth. It's not even what the seller thinks their home is worth. And it's definitely not what the buyer thinks the home is worth. What it is is what the market will bear for their home. What's the most we can get the market to bear for their home? And that's the area that we specialize in in helping them get the most that the market will bear for the home. You see, if it's my price, then I'm right or wrong. If it's the buyer's price, they always want a lower price. If it's the seller's price, they always want a higher price. If the appraiser's price, who knows where it's going to end up at. Today, yeah. We don't yeah, know. <laughs> it changes every day. Yeah. But if it's what the market will bear for the home, and you're hiring me to get absolutely the highest possible price the market will bear for your home, now I'm able to give the insights and expertise that we have to help you accomplish that goal. Then we want to do number two, which is positioning on the market. How do I position this on the market so you've got great photos? How do I position this on the market that has great videography? So often our job here is so much easier because our competition is using their iPhone. Uh, they're taking pictures uh, that are that that are not clear. They're dark. They leave the toilet seat up. They left the shower door open. They left trash on the floor. And you've seen them, Christine. I see you yeah. smiling. And people have dishes taken the picture. Sink. The yeah. dishes are in the sink. Yeah. Or my <laughs> or my the one that I hate the most. My pet peeve. They take a picture of them in the bathroom and oh, they yeah. get themselves <laughs> here. And so we talk about how to position the home on the market. How is it positioned? Do we want it to be positioned in the very best light? Then we need to use the best marketing materials. And then finally, how do we present and prepare the home to show? What do we do? And I always like to give these three in this order, but I always start with a little more commentary on the presentation and prepared to show. And I found that this has been very, very helpful because some people, when it comes to how to present the home, they've got a big budget set aside. You know, I've got three, five, 10, 20, $50,000 set aside. Other people have a hard time affording the smoke detectors and carbon monoxide detectors. Mm -hmm. So if you're not careful, you could come across and say, well, I want you to do this, 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 and this to the home, and they're overwhelmed. And they never get it done. And in some sense, they start jumping over the dollars, looking for the pennies, mm -hmm. doing these repairs. And now it takes six months, nine months to get the home up for sale and the kitchen's in complete chaos. And eventually they never finish, they never put it on the market. Uh, so I like to go through that process and I like to break it down into three parts. And we how do you present the home for sale? And there's really three different parts to it. The first uh, way that you can do it is what we call option one, and it's as is. And each of these options correlate with a price. And that's why you have to know the market. Because the option one as is, is probably a less of a list price than option two. 
and option two is less than option three, right? So option three is gonna get them the highest possible price, but they're gonna put some money into it. Option one, they have to put very little money into it, but it's gonna get them the lowest possible price. And then that way they can choose. Give the consumer the option to choose. Not a hundred options, give them two or three. When you do that, it makes it so much easier. These are, this is my three part commission structure. I walked you through that earlier. Limited, full service or certified, which one would you like to choose? This is how to best prepare the home. Option one, as is, two, investment, three, model home. Which one would you choose? When you do this and you put this in, in, it gives them the control that they don't have to say, I'm sorry, I don't have the budget to do carpet and finish. And you say, no, no, I think option one might be a good fit. Okay, here's what we think option one value is on the property. So option one is as is. And this is simply doing the minimum requirements to sell a home. And it usually involves things like cleaning. It usually involves things like preparing the landscaping. That may be mowing, edging, trimming. It usually involves things like installing smoke detectors or carbon monoxide, depending on the county or area they're in, the requirements of that municipality, gas shutoff valve or sewer lateral inspection. It's as is, it's the basic work they can do to present a clean, safe, safe. home. Mm -hmm. It also, by providing a clean, safe home, it also makes it most cooperative with financing terms. So some financing terms require certain things to be done to the home. So we want to have the biggest pool of buyers to choose from. So our as is generally is gonna include what it takes for us to also be able to include a VA buyer or an FHA buyer or a conventional buyer. And so we take that in consideration on option one. Option two, uh, those are my favorite and it's what most of our clients choose. And when they're preparing the home for sale, they can use option two and we call this the investment strategy. This is the return on investment. For every dollar you invest in option two in preparing the home for sale, you are likely to receive a multiple return. And you'll find that they almost always fit into five categories. Five categories exist in the investment stage almost every appointment that we go on. Those five categories in order of importance, number one is curb appeal. The front of the house is the most important picture. You're looking at that photo that you have, Christina, at the bottom. That It's got great curb appeal. You pull up to that home, you're kind of excited to walk into it. You saw it on Zillow and you're quickly contacting the agent that is listed next to it, or your agent to show you the property. Curb appeal, a good front photo, unlocks the other 40, 50, 60 photos in the video uh, the Matterport tour, the 3D tour, the virtual tour that exists along with it. A bad front photo never unlocks any of the others. Nobody ever sees them. Doesn't matter what the other photos look like. The most beautiful kitchen doesn't matter if it's got poor curb appeal. So curb appeal is critically important. Number two, second thing that we find most commonly, a can of paint goes a long ways. Average cost of a can of paint is about $28 and it can cover an entire room, walls, ceilings, and they should put paint on. Uh, the, usually to paint the property is an incredible return on investment. Very little investment, covers a lot of ground quickly. Also, do you notice that when you paint a house, it gives a fresh feel, a fresh smell? Most buyers don't think it's funny when you have the kids' hands prints all up and down the wall <laughs> as they got older. Uh, that means a lot to you. It means a lot to me. For my kids, it doesn't mean a lot to that buyer. So a fresh can of paint goes a long way. And a painter can help make that happen. Uh, we like painting what we call a two-tone color paint. So we typically paint the walls an earth tone gray or a cream. Ceiling, doors, baseboards, trims, window seals, window aprons would be a white. That provides a fresh contrast, fresh insight. Be careful here. If the seller goes and chooses their own colors and they've got a, a purple, a bright pink, uh, a, a, a vibrant green, uh, it may actually work against you. Yeah. And it happens. So give them some direction. We want an earth tone color here. 
use a color like a Sherwin-Williams interactive cream. Uh, a gray, a light gray is also very contemporary. I use that on the walls while we do everything else a white. This is what we call investment. The third thing I like to do in investment, uh, after we do curb appeal, after we do paint, after we do flooring, I want it to be clean. And I mean extremely clean. You know what I have found is that does it really matter who I bring into the home? They don't like other people's dirt. <laughs> the, the moment that the house feels dirty, uh, it's somebody else's dirt, somebody else's soil, somebody else's stain. It's like they'll look at the, the house and they'll say, well, I'm going to need to get it clean, and that's at least going to cost me $20,000. What cleaner costs $20,000? I've never met a cleaner that costs that much. Or they'll say something like, you know, that, that carpet is stained. I really need to replace it. That's going to cost thirty, forty thousand. dollars $40,000. Buyers add it up that way. That's buyer math for you. Um, so have it clean, number four. And number five, minimize. Less is more. Uh, when the home has less furnishings, it looks bigger, brighter, and better. When a home has less furnishings, it takes better pictures. If they don't use it, they ought to remove it. Very, I could say so much more on this topic, but having less is so much more when you're selling a home, especially on countertops, especially on bathroom countertops, kitchen countertops, on the refrigerator. It looks so much better and, and better photo shoots, better presents on the market. And so those are my five. So we do landscaping, painting, cleaning, uh, pardon me, we do flooring, cleaning, and then minimization. Those are the main five that exist in investment. When you do those five over and over, you will find that for every can of paint, for every landscaper that you hire to put some fresh bark or ground cover, for, for every, every uh, flooring company that you came out to bring a nice new carpet, it increases the value of the home exponentially. And it's a great return of their investment and a return on their investment. Now okay, I'm let's go to options. I'm just looking at yes. my background to say, uh-oh, am I everything, am I all the wrongs? Don't do this. <laughs> Let me go back to one more, Christina. So we're in show and sell. We're talking about how to present the home for sale, talking to you about how to prepare it. Uh, which was one of the three options. And the third one is model home. And you go into some properties and they've got an outdated kitchen, an outdated bathroom. And statistically, it is true when they upgrade kitchens and bathrooms, it's a great place to invest in your home. And you generally get your money back or even a return on your investment. But it's something you have to be very careful with. Because when you walk into a house that has an original kitchen, an original bathroom, and you decide to replace, you need to upgrade the countertops, and you tear off the countertops, the next thing you're likely to do is say, well, I could really use new cabinets too. And the new cabinets, you're going to do that. You better do new appliances. You can't put the avocado green appliances back in. So you put new appliances, but if you do new appliances, you need new fixtures, you need new fixtures, you need new faucets and a new sink. And what started out as a small project continues to grow and grow. And in your bathroom, you replaced the vanity sink, you've replaced the vanity countertops, you need new cabinets, you need new lighting, you need new mirrors, you need new, uh, a new shower enclosure. And it just grows and grows and grows. And what can happen with this model home strategy is that a homeowner who isn't used to doing this type of work can get, it can be so all consuming that the market is fluctuating. And what you told them the home is worth, what you told them the value of the property is or the price range, that the market begins to change. And all the while they're working on the home and you come back out six months later when they finally got the kitchen remodeled done and they finally have the bathroom remodeled done. And you're like, I'm sorry, the value dropped $30,000 on your property wait a minute, I did all of that to get more for the home, not less, and the market changed. So this is a very delicate strategy. It's important that you mention it in this phase of how do you prepare the home for sale. But it's imp I think it's important you mention it because some people ask, don't you think you ought to update the kitchen? Don't you think you ought to update the bathroom? And you've covered it. Just like you covered 
did, should you rent or should you sell, right? Like you've covered this before you ever got there. So they feel better about it. Few people fit into the model home. Who fits into the model home? Uh, the person that fits into the model home, the investor, the flipper. Uh, that's the person that fits into the model. They've owned this property as a rental property for years. They want the highest possible price. The tenant just moved out. Great, let's bring in the construction crew. Let's knock out a new kitchen, new bathroom, new flooring, new paint, landscaping. That's a great person for the model home. Who's not a great person for the model home? You have a person that is that barely has the budget to do the investment option to, and now they're trying to stretch to make that work. They're trying to contribute monthly to, through their paycheck to the general contractor to make that happen. That is not a good fit. They need to use that kitchen. They need to use those bathrooms. The model home strategy is very, very difficult. And though it's important that you describe it, it's also important that you make sure that you only encourage option three for the right person that has the capital to do that, they got the time to do that, and it's not gonna be an inconvenience on their family. Okay, so we've talked about how to prepare the home. We've talked a little bit about our marketing plan. That's important, that's in our brochure. We've talked a little bit about pricing the property. Uh, I generally like to, to wait till pricing is at the very end. What's the home worth? It is the king of all three of them, right? It was price, it was presentation and positioning. Price is the most important. Get it wrong and you're the worst realtor in the world. Get it right and the home sells within two weeks and you're the best realtor in the world. What's the difference? The difference was you priced it right. And the best way to determine, the best way to determine what a home is worth is to find out what a buyer was willing to pay for one like it. So look at those comparable sales. What sold in the neighborhood recently that similar property characteristics, similar bedroom count, similar bathroom count, similar year built, similar garage configuration, two car, single car, four car garage. Find apples for apples. This is what separates you from a Zillow who doesn't know neighborhoods, communities, upgrades and find properties that, that are like the subject property. They're apples for apples. And then you can say, this particular home is like your home. And the best way to know what a buyer's willing to pay for a home like yours is to find out what a buyer's willing to pay for a home like it. And this is one that's a good fit. And this is how long it took to sell, and this is what happened, and this is, and you can walk through that story and they're likely to have the experience of that same story. You can also get the market trajectory. Are values going up like they are today? If the value is going up on the property, you might be able to push the envelope and go a little higher. If the values are declining in a neighborhood or there's some external force, a factory that is coming in or going out of town, that can have an impact on the market. If values are declining, then you may not want to price it at what the last home sold for, and you might want to price it under that price point. Perfect. So I use the price property ending in, uh, you know, for, like a pri property we'd price say four ninety nine, nine nine nine, and that was pretty common. Or four hundred ninety nine thousand nine hundred ninety seven dollars, or five hundred forty nine thousand five hundred dollars. I've now changed my philosophy on how to price property, and once you have the best comparables, apples for apples, what's important is that we price the property. Uh, in between the brackets. Here's what I mean by that. If you're pricing a property and you're thinking 499,900, price it at $500,000 even. If hmm. you're pricing the property and you're thinking 549,999, price it at 550. Thinking about pricing it at 800,000, uh, 825, maybe you want to price it at 850 or 800. The brackets are really important. If I price a property at $499,999, then, the then the property only shows up on Realtor.com or Zillow or Movoto or Redfin or Trulia, and somebody does a search from $450 to $500 or $475 to $500, and I get only one buyer pool. But if I price it at $500,000, I benefit and the seller benefits from the buyer pool $450 to $500 and $500 to 550. And so I get two buyer pools associated there rather than one. And that can help increase the buyer pool, drive more attention. 
to the property. So don't just price the property, you know, with these creative, if you will, or these odd numbers. Use those milestones. If somebody's like, I want to price the property at 510 or 512, encourage them to go to 500,000. You're going to get a lot more activity to the property. And remember, the list price or the advertising price is one price, but the sales price of the property, that's what most people care most about. So by pricing the property at 500,000, I might get more offers and therefore generate a higher sales price as a result of benefiting from both the 500 to 550 pool and the 450, the 450 to 500 pool. Christina, are you hearing me? And does that make sense? Yeah, no, that's great. That's gold. So we've been doing that for the last three, four years, and it makes a big difference. And you got to explain it a little bit. You're not being lazy, just, well, let's do 500,000, let's 700,000, 800,000. So explain it to them that that's how buyers are, are finding it. That's what the market, how the market is designed. Our job is to get the highest possible price the market will bear for the home. And by doing that, we want to make sure that we benefit from the most amount of buyers in a buyer pool that we can. If we miss on the pricing piece, then nobody comes over to see the house. That's right. Mm -hmm. So it's super important. The pricing piece, like Rick said, it's king. That's right. Um, and oftentimes I'll have sellers say, well, I'm, I'm going to price it at 520 and that gives me some wiggle room to negotiate with somebody. Mm -hmm. You can't do that today uh, because nobody's going to walk into your house if it's mispriced. So you won't have anybody to talk to. So it needs to be priced right. That's right. And it's a, there's nothing wrong with saying, uh, this is where I, I think the market will bear for your home. Yeah. And we're going we're gonna to validate that. We're going to vet that. Because when we go on the market, you should have, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, three to five agents walk through your home every week. If you have three to five agents walk through the home every week, you are likely to get an offer in a reasonable amount of time. If you don't have three to five agents walk through and you get one or none, we're probably underpriced. And if I get 20, I'm probably gonna be able to prepare for you multiple offers. Mm -hmm. That's the pulse that we have on the market. We price the property based on what the market will bear for the home. We pulse the market based on how much activity we have while the top market is listed, the property is listed. Okay. So we talked about in the show and sell phase, lead in, investigate, show, sell. We talked about us uh, just taking them on a safe island, talking a little bit about the team and the three things that it takes to get the highest possible price, the least amount of inconvenience, and a reasonable amount of time. Uh, once you're done with that conversation, usually there's great uh, relationship that's built, there's some relationship equity that's been established, you're seeing their heads nod, and and you want to use in this last part as few of words as you can. Okay, so it's not the many words. Here it's less is more. And when you're ready to wrap up the conversation, you want to say something like, Wendy, would you like to hire me? Or I might say something like, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, would you like me to get the ball rolling? Mr. and Mrs. Seller, would you like me to get started? Mr. and Mrs. Seller, does this sound reasonable to you and would you like me to get going on it? I'm going to make it very simple and then I'm going to be quiet. I am not going to keep talking. So many agents will keep talking. I know you don't have to sell, me, sell with me and I know that there's three other agents coming to your house, but if you think about it, you know, I might be a good, no, 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 just mm -hmm. would you like to hire me? Quiet. Can I get the ball rolling? Quiet. And usually you're gonna get one of three answers. And maybe we do another call later on about objection handling and thing. But you're gonna get a yes. You know, I think we're ready. Or they might say something like, honey, what do you think? Or, you know, what do you think? And, yeah, I think this is good. I think we ought to go forward. And they're looking and you're like, okay, that sounds good. Would you like me to get the ball rolling? Would you like to hire me? Would you like me to get started? Real simple. And then be quiet. Let them answer. You might get a no. No, we want to, uh, we don't think we're ready to sell the home. No, we thought it was worth a lot more than what you think. No, we want to get our offer accepted on the other property first, okay? And you might get what I call a qualified maybe. Here's the qualified maybe. Let me think about it. Let me pray about it. Let me, let me consider it for a couple of days. And that's when you want to make the maybe qualified. 
that's no problem. I know you want to think about it. I know you want to pray about it. I know you want to consider it. Um, can I call you tomorrow at five o'clock or would six be better to follow up? Or you might say, and this has been very, very helpful, why don't I afford the two of you a measure of privacy? And if you're okay, I'll just step outside and give you an opportunity to talk. That way I'm here, I got all the paperwork, and if you decide you want to move forward, I can come back and we can get the ball rolling. That often is, is just enough, and you'll step outside, and I've done this dozens done of times. We've done this many times before. Mm -hmm. And then they'll say something like, okay, we've talked, we're ready. Mm -hmm. And, and I remember one time I did that and it was pouring rain outside. It was like a monsoon. And I came in and they felt so bad because I was absolutely <laughs> drenched. And they're like, we talked about it. We've interviewed a bunch of agents. We got more interviews to go, but we think you're the best fit. And, and just by saying, let me afford you a measure of privacy. Let me afford you a measure, measure of modesty. I'll give you an opportunity to discuss amongst yourself. Can I just step out in your backyard for a few moments? Usually that's all that it takes and it's so much better than having to come back. Sometimes you can't avoid it and you got to go back and you simply then say, uh, can I follow up with you tomorrow at 10 or would 11 be better? Can I follow up with you tomorrow at four or would five be better? And by, by, our, by doing that, what's going to happen is you're setting the expectation for you to follow up. And if you call them at that time and they're not ready, then you say, well, then can I follow up with you again the following day or later on this evening? Would seven work or would eight be better? And you just keep ending every appointment. And generally that produces the best experience for the homeowner in selling their home. Produces the best experience for the real estate professional that that's, articulates the value of your, of your industry, your team, and you as the guide of walking them through the home, the sale of the home. And it usually best represents the market because you're most knowledgeable in that process. And you're not reading a script, but you're following a track to be productive and walk them through every step of the way. And Wendy, you and I were talking earlier about um, commissions and staging and how that's one of the questions that comes up. Can you address that for us too? So I wanted to talk to Rick about that just briefly and you had mentioned maybe we should do another call just on, commi uh, not commission, but objection handling. Yeah. And we can do that outside of this. Okay. But the commission, the commission objection does come up a lot, especially today um, because listings are kind of far and few uh, to get. We don't have a lot of inventory. Do you want to talk about or just share well, with, uh, you have one particular strategy that you use. I do, and, and many of you who are watching this have been on these appointments with me, and you know mm -hmm. that I like to use it, but I will tell you right now the biggest commission objection handling technique, and we'll schedule an entire call just to go over that. The biggest one is doing this presentation right, mm -hmm. because by the time you get to the end of it, um, you will find that if you've built enough relationship equity, they like you, they know you, they trust you, they believe you can get the job done, commission is usually not going to be an obstacle. Remember, your strategy is to get them the highest possible price. Mm -hmm. Whatever commission they pay is an investment in getting them that highest possible price that the market will bear. Generally, I like to bring a market analysis or a CMA summary is what they call it in our local MLS. And I like to show what other company, what other co-op agents are, are paid. And I'll actually put that feature into the CMA summary. And as I'll go down the list, it'll say something along the lines of 2.5, 2.5, or three, or three and a quarter, or sometimes 2.25. And that tells me generally what their neighbors were willing to pay, not for the listing side, but they were willing to pay that to the buyer's agent. That gives me a starting point of what the market is. The market not only is what to bear when it comes to uh, what they'll get for the sale of the home, but also what the market is for commission because certain areas represent different commission. So that document helps to say, well, let me tell you what the last four neighbors paid in real estate commission to the selling agent. Uh, and then I'll share with you what I would suggest that we pay to the selling agent and then what, what our commission would be uh, to help 
we do this. And that process helps say, okay, they were successful, they were successful, they were successful, they were successful, because you're looking at the sales in the community, and they paid three, and they paid three, and they paid three, and they paid three. And so the way that it works is that it will pay the buyer specialist 3% and then our office receives 3%. Or we'll pay the buyer specialist 2.5 and we receive 3%, we'll provide the marketing resources, right? Based on the circumstance. So the idea is that you, you want to bring other people at the table that have been successful, even metaphorically. They were successful and this is what they paid. They were successful and this is what they paid. This is the service that I offer. And that can be a really good starting point on how to discuss commission. Because it's no longer what you're charging, it's now what the market will bear. The market is paying out a real estate commission. The marking is bearing for the sale of your home about X amount of dollars on the sale price of your property. So thank you, Rick and Wendy, for sharing this coveted and valuable information that most agents guard carefully. Um, like I said, you can go to Connect with Rick Fuller and click on the gear icon to get those resources. And you can join us next week when Rick shares another important topic about real estate. Um, and most investors keep this to themselves too, the triple eight formula to buying and holding real estate, which you don't want to miss. <laughs> so have a great day and we can't wait for you to join us next time. Thanks, Wendy and Rick. Thanks, Thank Christina. you. Bye. Bye.